Now our next speaker, his name is Rickard Saber, and uh, he is a startup, business, slide? and technology okay. guru. Um, before joining HTC as the senior vice president, he um, senior vice president of virtual reality, he ran all marketing for Google, for Google products in Europe. And now he's paving the way in virtual reality platforms with HTC Vive. So, Rickard. Hello. Hello, everyone. So, how many here have tried virtual reality? Hand up. Whoa. Whoa. All right, I think I'm done. Thank you. It's like, no, that's, that's excellent. There's actually hope. So um, I will talk to you about how we're going to change the world with AR and VR, uh, or actually how you are going to change the world. So I'll talk a little bit about the technology and why it's really useful to changing the world. And then I will talk a little bit about how we can change the world uh, using the sustainability goals as, as sort of a framework for that. Let's see, do we have my presentation here? Can we turn down the lights up front? So we'll see, you'll see the screen rather than me. So for those of you who don't know Vive, so Vive is a technology that enables you to travel into any world, anywhere you want to go uh, through virtual reality. So it's truly transformative because it basically takes all your senses and you can be anywhere. You can be anyone and you can, can do anything, which is truly amazing. So it's a little bit hard to kind of explain virtual reality. It is a little bit like uh, the movie The Matrix where Neo is sitting in front of Morpheus and uh, he has the red pill and the blue pill. And Morpheus says he cannot explain the matrix. Uh, you have to experience it. But there is something called mixed reality, uh, which is a technique that films you when you're wearing the headset, jumping around like a foolish person. And then at the same time, it films what's happening in VR and gives you a sense for what's going on. So let's have a quick video clip to get everyone on the same page. Can I have sound on the video? Let's see. Walking into the walls. Oh, this is so cool! I can move all this stuff! <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh. Cool, huh? So, so when you think about virtual reality, it's kind of turning your imagination, anything you can imagine, into the real world. So that's virtual reality. On the other hand, you've probably heard about augmented reality. And typically, you have your, your phone, you look through the camera, and then it interjects digital objects. So augmenting reality. So it's kind of turning your reality into imagination. So it's a little bit. Uh, same thing, but on a different spectrum. On the one thing, you kind of see the real world and you have additional objects. And then on the other end, you're basically completely immersed. So uh, if you think about uh, one use case, uh, so I'm from Sweden. So how many here have been to IKEA? OK, all of you. 
So of course, you know, before you go there, today you have the IKEA catalog, your parents are looking at it, but now you can actually see if that sofa or whatever it is that you're gonna buy is actually gonna fit into your living room before you buy it. And that's pretty, that's pretty cool. So of course you can do that with pretty much anything. And the way it works is that you basically scan your room and it maps it in the 3D space and then you can put 3D objects in your room. So uh, when thinking about uh, VR and AR, it is sort of a next computing platform. And if you think back, you know, you had the PC, the rise of the PC, uh, people were connecting to the internet, you had the rise of the internet, you had the mobile phone. And I would argue that VR and AR is a new computing platform. But also, it's a new way of interacting with computers. So if you think back uh, when the PC came, you had the keyboard, that was a very primitive way for you to communicate with the computer. Then you had the mouse, you could move around a little bit. When the phone came, you had touch, you could touch the screen. And today you're probably talking to Google, asking it, or you're talking to Alexa or Siri or you know, one of those assistants. So when we're coming into VR, what's happening is that you're kind of stepping into the computer so that your body becomes the interface to the computer. You can move around in the computer-generated world, and you can interact with it, you can talk with it. So it's the next generation of computing. And in each of these phases, primarily the first use case has been gaming. So of course you play computer games. And uh, it's 10 times better, which means that everyone will adopt it. If it's a little bit pricey in the beginning, however, if you're really into games, you're gonna, you don't care, you're just gonna get it. However, it wasn't necessarily uh, games that made you know, the PC big or the web big or the mobile phone big. Probably today you're sitting with social media and taking photos and tweeting and you know, you're doing other things. Of course you're playing games, but it may not be the, the reason that you're getting a phone today. So the question then is what is it that's gonna be big when it comes to AR and VR? And we don't really know yet, and it's gonna be up to you guys to figure it out, but we do believe that there will be things like exploring things, learning things. Uh, of course, you'll be able to create things in three dimensions, and if you're an architect or a designer, this is an awesome medium. It's gonna be the most social media where you meet people, you don't have a flat Skype screen, you're actually gonna see, see them in 3D. And of course, uh, all kinds of Hollywood experiences, and of course, all brands will come here as well. So it's an exciting time ahead. We're kind of in, in the year, two of VR, I would say. The other thing that's happening now is that you've probably seen these 360 videos where you can sort of look around, uh, and then you have these computer generated. But what's gonna happen is that the, the cinematic world, the photorealistic world, and the computer gaming world are coming together so that you can capture pretty much anything in a very photorealistic uh, way. And I think the, the best way and the most impressive way is what Google did with Google Earth. I think, you know, Everyone loves Google Earth, it's beautiful. But uh, if you think about Google Earth in VR, it's even more uh, amazing. So let's have a quick look how you can, in VR, travel to anywhere, anywhere on the planet. Suddenly, things like geography becomes a little bit more interesting. Uh, and of course, before you travel anywhere, you, you'll check it out. But I do think that education, and if you think about it, you're all, you're all sort of in the, in the middle of it right now, education is gonna be radically different. Because of course, we all know that if you read something, that's great, if you see a picture or a movie, you, know, it's, you get it even better. But of course, if you actually could, if you could go anywhere on the planet, of course, you'll learn so much more. And I do think that these experiences, uh, and I want to show you one which is called Everest, where you actually can go to Mount Everest, you can climb Mount Everest. 
uh, and interact with it, of course, you're going to learn much more about Mount Everest uh, and remember it much better than ever before. So let's have a quick look here. So this guy is basically in the experience. So this is the mixed reality. So in this case, he's you know, looking around. The graphics and the way it's, it's actually taken from real photos of Mount Everest. And you can you know, interact with, in this case, probably Odin's messenger here. And uh, these uh, controllers he has, they have haptic feedback. So when he put the ice hack in the eyes, he feels the sort of the, the haptic feedback from, from actually ha having the ice pick in his hand. Everest, but now essentially everyone can go to the top of Mount Everest and actually see what it looks like. Everyone can go everywhere. You can. My my two young girls, Alexandra and Athena, uh, they love to go underwater and you know uh, see the whale and watch all kinds of uh, glowing jellyfish. So you can go anywhere that you want. You can go to the moon. You can actually be on the Apollo 11 mission and learn about the mission. Mission, and uh, of course you're going to remember it for the rest of your life. So the other thing that's really, really popular today is that since you can move around in 3D, you can create anything. So this is an application called Tilt Brush, where you basically can paint in 3D. Uh, and it's, it is truly something that you can spend so much time on. So you can create anything, you can go anywhere, you can be anyone, which is really exciting. So of course, uh, the big companies in the world, uh, like BMW, for example, when they sell the car or you sell a Tesla car, of course you want to build your own car with the right colors, but now you can not only do that, in VR you can actually drive the car, like a computer game, uh, which is much more exciting uh, than anything you can imagine. And one of the reasons that brands uh, are so interested is uh, something called the power of touch. And let me give you a little, a little example. So in a research journal called the Consumer uh, Journal of Research, they said that if you go into a store, let's imagine that you go into your Safeway. You go into the store, you pick up a bottle of, I don't know, shampoo. And then you put it down. The research says that you're now much more likely to pay money for that bottle of shampoo compared to something else because you created an emotional bond by touching it. Same thing if you touch your friend, you actually create an emotional relationship. So what's interesting is if you actually close your eyes and just visualize that you actually took that shampoo bottle in your hand and put it back, the same thing happens. So you don't have to have real touch. It's just that you imagined it and you create a relationship. So this is very, very important with the medium. The other thing uh, which is important with the medium is how it affects your brain. So we all know that we have our left brain and our right brain. And, you know, maybe your part of your brain saying that, okay, this is more cheap. This shampoo is more cheap. So therefore, it's logical for me to buy it. However, the other brain thinks that, you know, you love this thing, you touch this thing, You're, you have an emotional connection. As it turns out, when they done neuroscientific experiments comparing watching video, like a shampoo commercial, with being in VR, you're 27% more likely to have an emotional relationship with a product if you're in VR. So there's a very, very powerful medium. And why am I telling you this? Because it's going to help us save the world. Uh, so in Davos, uh, together with the World Economic Forum and uh, the United Nations, we started something called VR for Impact. And as it turned out, uh, of course, the medium is really, really good at creating empathy about you actually caring about something. So if you, take, uh, if you take something like poverty, uh, there are some 800 million people who have, you know, beloved the poverty line, so less than $2 a day. 800 million. I'm, come from, I'm from Sweden. We have 10 million people in our country. 800 million is more than twice the population of the United States. So it's like a lot of people are in pretty bad shape. So your right brain and your left brain thinking, well, you know, I understand the data, but do you really care? 
do you really care? Are you gonna do something about it today? Or are you just gonna buy another hamburger? So do you really care? So the thing is that, of course, what uh, UN has seen, who done a lot of fundraising for these issues, is of course, if you have a relationship with uh, uh, Linnea, of course, you know, she, you, she looks at you, and you kind of touch her, and you have a relationship, and you need to do something about it. Of course, VR can take you to the refugee camp and do something completely different, so you have to care. So what they saw is that the donations after using VR went up by 2x, so double the amount of donations. So there was something there, still early on. So what we wanted to do was that we wanted to bring together the causes, people who you know, want to work with the uh, sustainability goals, regardless if it is poverty or hunger or climate change. We want to bring together those causes and the things that you think are really, really important with the technology, with the creators and the developers in the VR world. So we have the causes and the developers working together. So we set aside $10 million to fund projects to see if we can make a change. Maybe not solve them, but at least uh, be on our way. So we, the first projects that we funded, and I thought I'll talk to, the, to you about a couple of these. Uh, one is the tree, space VR, and the honeybees. So let me talk to you a little bit about them. So uh, the rainforest, the lungs of the earth. Um, do you think the rainforest is important for us? OK. Because we get all of our air and oxygen from there. So what happens if we take down the rainforest, do you think? No oxygen will all die. That's, that's pretty bad. Can you, can you guess how much rainforest is taken down every minute? Let's pretend that one acre is one football field. How many football fields do you think go down per minute? 600? 500? Yeah? OK, so we're in pretty good shape. Only 84 football fields every minute. So I have someone calculate what is that in a day, and we'll find out that number at the end. So 84 football fields every minute. That's, that's not good. So some developers took on this challenge together with the Rainforest Alliance. And they were thinking about how can we make people feel and care about that, because the number is clearly crazy. So they created an experience called the tree. And the tree uh, takes place in the rainforest. And it starts by you being a little seedling, and then you're kind of growing into a tree. So you are the tree. So you grow up, your arms is your branches, you feel the wind in your face, you see the little ants uh, crawling around, and it's an experience where you, you actually are the tree, and uh, you're loving it, it's beautiful. The ending is that you get deforestized, you get cut down, which is a very, very painful experience. So of course, when you come out of there, you actually created this bond by being a rainforest tree, and now you're being cut down. People come out crying. And of course, they want to take action and change and save the forest much more than they ever did before. So uh, let me give you another example. Another uh, project we did was called the Extraordinary Honeybee. So I don't know, I didn't know much about honeybees, and, but one of the things that was interesting was that a brand called Hagen Dazs, everyone heard about Hagen Dazs and the ice cream, decided to sponsor this. And I, first I was thinking, let's not, let's not support this product. It's a corporate marketing project. And we're like, wait a minute, it's interesting actually that brands are trying to make a difference. So as it turned out, honeybees are essential. Anyone know why? So they help pollinate. Uh, which means that if you don't have pollinators, nothing will grow. And as it turned out, many places where we have agriculture, you only have one type of crop, which means that once they pollinated that, there's nothing left to do. And there's no food for the bees, so essentially the bees die. So the way our modern arch architecture have solved this is that they basically bring the bees to the you know, apple orchard or something. And then once they've done their work, they take them somewhere else. So there's no natural way for actually uh, pollinating that area. So if they don't bring the bees back, everything will die. So it's coming very soon, this experience, but I want to show you a little teaser that Hagen does created.
Within your world, a tiny microcosm exists, and its entire existence is being threatened. My home, my friends, are all disappearing. You see, if my world disappears, so will yours. Now let me show you everything at my side. Follow me! We can stop this before it's too late! Save the honeybees. And uh, let me, let's, do, let's do a poll here. How many think your parents know that if the honeybees goes away, so does you know, pretty much everything else? Hmm. OK. All right, so there's an educational moment there for parents as well. So I do think that you know, with the sustainable goal, there are so many different areas where this medium can be helpful. So when you're thinking about changing the world, when you're thinking about uh, your, you know, your next hackathon or so. Think about how this technology can be used for good. And I do think that probably the biggest challenge that we have is that of ch climate change. Because if we don't fix this together, you know, there, there will pretty much be no planet left. Uh, and that will be a bad thing. So one of the uh, experiments that I thought were the most interested uh, was something called Space VR. And uh, Space VR, what they wanted to do was that uh, they want to share an experience that every astronaut gets when they are up in space. So roughly f just over 500 people have been up in space since the dawn of time, uh, or at least that we know of. There might be aliens as well. Uh, and what they say is that you know, when you have this perspective looking down on Earth, and you see you know, how thin the atmosphere is, and you realize that one you know, meteorite or something can crush that, if we don't fix it ourselves with you know, all of the fumes coming out of our cars or industries or other crazy stuff that we do as a species. The other thing they realize is that they don't really see any borders of our planet. They don't see Christians, Muslims, Hindus. They don't, they don't see the religious conflicts. They don't see uh, North Korea. They don't see Trump. You know, none of that exists. We're just like one delicate, small piece of dust flying through the universe. And of course, you know, we need to take care of it because if we don't, you know, we're pretty much gone. So it's called the overview effect. So when they come down, they have a different perspective on life and that we are one on this planet. So the idea is that they want to send up a virtual reality camera, uh, an HD virtual reality camera, so that all of you and your parents and your grandkids when you have them will be able to have the perspective of an astronaut and get the overview effect so that you also feel incentivized to help save and change the world. So with that, I hope you all save the world together. Thank you very much. Any, any questions, please, yes. So, yeah, uh, it's, I mean, I understand that we could have really great changes with virtual reality, but I also feel like it could be extremely dangerous because the people who create these films, I mean, for now we have good intentions, but if it becomes an essential part of our educational system, and if people uh, are able to control that and create different affluences, it could also become really dangerous. Because as you said, it creates empathy or like, yes. we could kind of control people's emotions. So, so let me see if I, if I got it correctly. So I think you're saying on the one hand, it's great because it can create empathy in us for positive change but also it has a negative side. And of course, you know, if you take computer games, for example, where you're shooting and killing people, and clearly if you do that all day, you know, what's real and what's not real? Is that, is that your question? Yeah, and, I, and I, th I think actually you're absolutely right. And I think we don't have to wait for virtual. Just look at, uh, let's look at internet. Let's look at your social media profile. Um, let's do a little test how addicted you are. How many here check out internet every day, hand up. H keep your hand up, keep your hand up. Every hour. Okay, okay, no, so you're pretty, pretty sane people here. Okay, let's, let's do one or two. Okay, how many here, if you have a choice, you have a choice, you can from this day 
never ever connect to the internet, email, social media, your friends, or you know anything like that. You will completely be offline for the rest of your life, or you have to sacrifice the top of your pinky toe, just a little snit. It will be very quick. We'll have anesthetics. Don't worry. Just a little bit. So you do that. It'll take you 30 seconds. You won't feel a thing. Top of your pinky. Or never be online again. How many here wants to be online again? Hand up. Okay, there's a lot of pinky toes to going, going, going down. <laughs> so you are addicted. So I do think that with any technology, it's always a dark side. So I think that the challenge is that uh, if I look at uh, Alexandra and Athena, there is no one really educating us on how to use this medium. I mean, we see that with cyberbullying, we see that with a lot of different things. So I think it's a combination of making sure that parents, friends, schools, and I guess sort of government understand what these things mean. So it's a problem, you're right. Yes, whoever's next. Maybe gentleman over here. Yeah, thanks for the wonderful talk, Rickard. Uh, I just have a question about how you transferred from being a uh, marketing head at Google to you know involving yourself with virtual reality and HTC and another kind of advice to all students here because I feel that virtual reality is something that's still in its beta phase and development phase and you really don't have a lot of resources out there to learn more about virtual reality. So as students and as people who want to learn more about it, what kind of resources or books or websites or anything would you suggest to us? Yes. So, so for, the, for those who missed that, so I, I got a good job in you know, 2007 to run marketing for Google products and then I bought here. But I was always attracted to uh, the purpose of a company. So in, in the early days, Google, of course, wanted to organize the world's information, making it universally accessible and useful so that school kids in Nigeria would have the same access as school kids here at Stanford. Uh, and I think there's, there's something powerful on being part of that revolution. I think most of you probably don't just want to have, you know, of course you want to have a job and you want to make some money. However, you also want to be part of something bigger than yourself. You want to make a change. That's, that's why you're here. And I think that uh, if you follow that passion and dare to be dif different, as Annika said, I think that's, that's, you know, good things will come to you. Uh, and it's not an easy ride. So I don't think there's really any any books, you need to find your passion. And what's interesting with virtual reality, it doesn't matter if you're a, a teacher or an engineer or a doctor or you know, whatever, you know, it could be someone working with climate change. Once you understand the technology and you understand the doctoring or the architecturing or whatever you're doing, you can sort of see what's new coming out of that. So it's, maybe it's the challenging the conventional thinking and you sort of see new things. So I think if you keep your passion, what you truly think is important for you in your heart, and then maybe understanding some of these new technologies early on, you could be a change maker uh, in making a difference. Okay, yeah, An Annika's writing another book on Virtual Reality 101, so we'll give you a good, are you gonna give that book to everyone here or not? Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make, if we have a goodler here, we'll, we'll see if we'll, we'll send you some links. Uh, on uh, you know how to catch up with technology if you're interested in this area because I think regardless of what your passion is you, it can be used for that. All right, let's take some more questions. Yes, ma'am. How are you planning on making the technology of VR accessible to more people so you can make impact on them? Yes. So how can we make the the technology more accessible? So actually, in the 90s there was virtual reality as well, uh, and. Uh, the problem then was that the computing power, the computer cost millions of dollars, and the software wasn't there there. So there are three factors that are in play now that will make this change happen today. And it is that all of you probably have a mobile phone today, or you have access to a PC. Uh, the other thing is that the content or the services can be distributed to you freely over the internet. So it can be sent to anyone. And the third thing is production of content is uh, becoming available. So in the, in the old days, you had someone producing content and someone consuming it. But today, you're also a producer because you're doing videos, you're doing photos, you're doing all kinds of social media. And actually, the tools to create these AR and VR stuff, you know, 360 videos or AR applications, it's pretty easy. And it's becoming easier. So we're all going to be producers and consumers at the same time. So if you have production, 
distribution and consumption working out, it is going to happen. So I do think that even though you won't have the, the Vive sort of high-end uh, version today, but in five years' time, that's just going to be... Uh, let me take an example. Seven years ago, the iPad was launched. Only seven years ago. And of course, at that time, everyone was thinking, why do I need an iPad? Because I have a computer and I have a phone. And this in-between thing, why do I need that? It's turned out to be the fastest growing consumer device you know, since the dawn of time. And no one talks about what they're doing on their iPad anymore. We, it's just another way for you to do things. And I think in five or seven years' time, we won't really talk about AR and VR. It will just be another way for you to do your homework or connect with friends across the world. Uh, so I do think it's, it's, it's happening. But if you can understand the technology earlier than everyone else, plus your passion, you're going to change the world. Okay, two more questions. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, how long does it take from the actual idea to publishing the game? How long does it take? So, sorry, speak a little bit closer. <laughs> sorry. How long does it take to develop a game or a movie from the actual idea to publishing it? So, so how long does it take to develop a game from, from sort of start to finish? And the answer is, it depends. Uh, so, uh, actually, some of the most popular games, uh, there's a zombie game uh, from some friends of mine in Sweden. Basically, a guy and his wife did it. It's a multiplayer, ex extraordinary experience. Uh, later this year, we have Doom coming out, you have Fallout coming out, Eleanor, so some sort of iconic game. Of course, they spent you know, over a year doing it, and they had like hundreds of people. So it kind of depends. But I do think that the tools of creating something uh, is there so that you actually, in a hackathon, uh, if we were to do a VR hackathon, you could all create all kinds of great experiences, you know, visualizing, you know, climate change or poverty or whatever the things is that you're, you're passionate about. Okay, you have to tell me how much time we have because a lot of questions there. Yes, please. Hi, Mr. Stiver. Um, it was wonderful hearing you. My name is Donna. And I had a question related to the empathy side of VR. You said it's um, your goal is to integrate empathy using VR. And you showed us a picture of Leah. Was it her name? Um, so I was wondering. I just made that. I made that up, by the way. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I was wondering how you would use VR to bring about the effect of empathy to Leah, where um, I don't think she knows what a mobile phone is or her family knows what a mobile phone is or have ever used one before. So how would you use VR exactly, precisely to um, affect Leah in a positive way? Yeah. So the, the example uh, that I used on that slide, so let me just go back. So in 2015, uh, there was a VR experience made in 360 video called Clouds Over Sidra. And what they did was that they brought, it, they brought you back to the refugee camp. And with 360 video, even though it's early, you can just sort of sit with your you know, cardboard and look around, suddenly you actually understood what it's like in a refugee camp. And then you get to follow uh, uh, this girl and you know, when you actually watch someone, you have eye contact, and this is the image that I tried to transmit, is that once you have eye contact with someone and you see how you know, they're sad, you can sense their feelings. Uh, and that's what movies are really good at. They do a close up and you see Tom Cruise and he's really upset and you, know, uh, you, know, you get the emotional thing. So I think you can tell that emotional story, but you also see that you know, people lying in the street, they have flies in their eyes, their bellies are you know, swollen or they get beaten by guards or you know, whatever it is. Once you actually have that experience, you see it for yourself, then your right, right brain and left brain kind of understand what's going on and you realize this is not acceptable. And then the, you question yourself, what can I do about it? And I think that's why the medium is so much more powerful than just reading about it in a book saying that, you know, it's terrible. And then but this will give you a different sort of emotional response. Yes, gentlemen, over here. Um, thank you very much for your insights, Mr. Richard. Um, so as a follow-up to the previous question from a, human's right, uh, from a human rights perspective, um, I see VR as being a very useful and effective tool in tackling human rights violations for groups particularly like the Amnesty International um, and, for example, the Human Rights Watch in the form of perhaps VR drones, um, etc. Um, do you see VR as bringing more transparency in the world? And what does the timeline for that application look like? 
So, so the, yes. So the answer is yes. I do think that uh, new technologies of VR will bring more transparency. And I think there, there are two ways of doing it. So you mentioned VR drones, for example, so that you could uh, show the refugee camp or you could show the deforestation, how quickly it's actually moving. Uh, I think the other thing which is really interesting is that computer graphics and animations is, is pretty advanced now. So you can see time lapse on, for example, how fast the forest is being you know, uh, destroyed. So I think there are various ways where you can use either VR or augmented reality. Um, and um, one of the things which is interesting with the camera is you can sort of see how it looks today. But for augmented, you could actually look at how did it look you know, 10 years ago. And you can sort of see the, the dramatic change in, in certain places. So it, I, the, this is not future. The, the technology is here today. And that's why I'm here talking to you about it, because if you know about it, then hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll use it to your advantage. All right, All let's right have... thank you, Rickard. I think that's it for questions. All right. I will be around uh, outside here later on if you want to chat with me in the break. Thank you.